So now that we've talked about this triple bottom line about trying to change how we measure and report things, let's just take a little bit of a, of a look at that subject because um, it, it's valuable to be, under, to be able to understand what we're talking about here. In order to make this change in an organization, a number of things have got to happen. Specifically, I'll talk about three of them. First of all, once a man, an, an executive committee or a board realizes that this concept is valuable, and will help them drive a stronger and more successful company and a greater bottom line, they have to immediately begin to move into compliance in these areas. Now sometimes they might be for being forced into compliance. If new rules and regulations are being uh, developed by the government, they may suddenly find themselves in a position where, you know, we've got three months to um, to change certain things in the way the company is being run. So use that time as an opportunity to make a bigger structural change to the company. In order to create this compliance now, of course we don't just walk into the office the next day and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. There's got to be a process of gathering the information together that is relevant and relative to your particular company. And it's very individual. So you have to examine the four partners that you have, uh, the shareholders, the employees, the customers, and the environment, in other words, the materials that you use. And in each one of those areas, determine what is required to make them sustainable. So with the shareholders, it's pretty easy. That's not that complicated. The shareholders essentially want two things. No surprises and no surprises. They want the company to grow. They want their investment to be sustainable so that they don't wake up one day and find out you're involved in a multi-billion dollar lawsuit and they want um, a reasonable amount of growth in the profitability of the company but they are not going to want an unrealistic amount of growth because they realize anything that's unrealistic is only going to be accomplished through some sort of deception or manipulation so that's a pretty easy way to understand the compliance of the shareholders. What about the employees? Well, the employees want to be able to come to a place of work and feel that the effort they put in for the eight or nine hours that they're there is valuable. Everybody wants to, it doesn't make a difference how much you make. Everybody that wakes up in the morning and goes into work wants to be respected and valued for the work they do. Now you as the manager have got to understand what is it that my employees need specific to my company. So you may find that there are things that you never suspected. Maybe they want to feel that part of the effort and the work they're doing uh, is being donated to some sort of charity. And so if the company decides to have some kind of a matching program or some sort of a, a, a program that, that enables the company to give money to different charities and connect the employees to that effort, that may make them feel amazingly uh, great. So I'm not, I mean, I'm not giving you, you know, easy solutions. I'm just letting you know that it's outside the box. The answers for this are not, well, let's just give the employees more money. You'll find that money is usually number five on the list of things that make employees happy. And always at the top of the list is feeling valuable, being respected. <coughs> so uh, again, you have, in order to, comp 
to come into compliance, you've got to explore those issues within your particular company. Third, customers. Now, customers have a very simple formula. They buy the pleasure that they want. It doesn't make a difference if they're buying gas, milk, uh, fashion clothing, yachts, or spaceships. The only reason that people do any of those, buy any of those things, the only reason that Jeff Bezos spent I don't know how many billions to build a spaceship is because it gave him pleasure. It's just as simple as that. You have got to keep your eye on the pleasure buttons of your customers and make sure that you have a clarity on how they are changing, if they are, or how they are evolving. If you constantly rely on what you did last year to be successful this year, you may find yourself missing the boat. And you'll be behind either in some technology or in some styling or fashion aspect of whatever it is that you're making. So this requires a specific effort and, and, uh, and a group to target and to find out what is it that gives our customers pleasure. And then that's what we're going to build. As perfect example was Stu Leonard in the stories that we've, that we've given. And finally, um, we're going to look at the materials, the environment, however you want to understand it, and try to uh, determine where is our specific industry going. What's the future? If, I'm, if I make uh, notebooks, my name is Hill, the Hillroy Company, um, and paper supplies are dwindling, is that where I want to be? Maybe what I should be trying to do is seeing if there are different ways that I can tap into the need that um, that people have for taking notes. Maybe it's something electronic, some sort of a tablet, some sort of an app, some sort of uh, you know software. I don't know. I'm not in the textbook business. Uh, sorry, the notepad business. But clearly, as a company, if that's the business you're in, you've got to be on top of what's going on technologically so that you can prepare yourself for whatever transitions are going to come down the road. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is essentially the compliance portion, um, which you start to do right away. The next thing you have to do is create a, a degree of integrity in the company. I mean, it's really great for me to talk about this in the course, and everybody sits there and nods their head, and, and they agree with me, because, of course, everything I'm saying kind of just is basic common sense. But now we want to implement this in the company. This is not going to happen from the middle management level up or down. This has got to be the culture of the company, which means from the top down, either board of directors or executive office. The integrity and the philosophy of what is happening and the reward, the consequences or the rewards, they've got to be from the top down. How we measure success, how we reward success, how we accomplish all of these goals has got to start from the top. So a middle manager can certainly suggest but a middle manager cannot create a culture in the company that drives the behavior of the people in this way. Only the upper management can do that. And the final part of creating um, this triple bottom line is, of course, a process. It's got to be a dynamic system. I mean, anybody can write a book of... Uh, of um, you know, corporate standards, ethical rules. Enron had a book. Their book was, I think, 98 pages long. But they were crooks. So what does it make a difference if you've got a 98-page book of ethical values? It's, it's the behavior and the implementation 
that's significant. So the system has got to be ongoing. It's got to be dynamic. It has to involve training, reporting, rewards that are matched to the goals that you have, consequences. You know, any system that has no consequences, no rewards, no training, is just um, a philosophical statement. And that's not going to accomplish the cultural change that your textbooks have been talking about and the articles have been talking about. It's not going to accomplish the cultural change that's necessary in the organization. And that is essentially what drives the, uh, the, the growth and the development of, of the organization in the area and in the way that you want. For example, if, if you want to report on the environmental connection that you're making in terms of being sensitive to the resources you need, because let's say you use trees or vegetable material or whatever, you know, you're a, a food processor. So you've got to think about, well, what's important to, to the environment here? Sustainability. My shareholders, my employees, they want to know they've got jobs, my customers. They want to know they've got product and jobs and profitability for the long run. So what are we doing with the way food is being grown? Oh, we are becoming dependent on monster corporate farms. That's how we do our food processing. Well, that is putting us in a very dangerous position. Because if we no longer control the production of the tomatoes, and we're just buying them because they're less expensive from the factory farm, maybe in the long run that's damaging us. And maybe we should start building our brand towards something more quality focused, more taste focused, um, and using our own farms. I'm not saying that's what you want to do. I'm just giving you an idea of, of the kind of thinking that can go on. Similarly, if you're looking at uh, r reporting on the social aspect of your company, well, how long have people been working here? Oh, the average uh, employee is here for three years? Really? You mean after three years they get fed up and leave? What's wrong? Are we not paying them enough? We're not giving them enough benefits? What's the problem that we're turning people over that much? Because if we are, it's costing us money to retrain and retrain and retrain people to come and work. So, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that the triple bottom line creates a whole new type of manager that is very, very effective if they're doing the job properly. So I want to just explain to you that, you know, in your personal life and in the business world, there's two kinds of people that I call the proactive and the reactive. Now, the reactive is easy to explain. A reactive person responds in a nice way, sometimes, not in a nice way, other times, to whatever the situations are in front of them. So if there's a sexual harassment, oh, you know, they'll, they'll deal with the issue and investigate and do whatever they feel is appropriate. But they react. As a manager, they're not thinking about what will happen. They're responding to what is happening. And that is one type of manager and, unfortunately, probably the majority of managers. And it's the same thing with people in life. Most people live life by responding to whatever happens to them. Whatever person comes into their life, whatever person asks them out for a date, if you're dating, um, they, they're essentially just going through life if I can be dramatic, as professional victims. They're waiting to see what's going to happen to them and then they'll respond. And many of the issues that you hear discussed today are all about these reactive societal groups that we've created that are just waiting for what's going to happen next. On the other hand, there is a very select little group of people the proactive people. They think about what they would like to have. Let's say in individually, I'd like to have 
a university education. I want to be an accountant or a marketing person or a whatever. So how am I going to accomplish that is, of course, the next question. Well, I've got to go to a university. I have to have the marks to get into a university. Well, I better start working on that in high school. A proactive person has a plan. Now, some plans are way better than others. But a plan, period, is better than nothing, is better than reacting. Sadly, many people that start off proactive for some reason end up reactive. But proactive managers have a plan, a strategy. Where are we taking this company? We make food products. Okay? What's next? Well, you know what? Maybe we want to get into frozen food products. Frozen foods are a totally different uh, production process than fresh foods. Different packaging, different systems for making it. So I want to take us, let's say you're proactively saying, I'd like to take us into the frozen food market. Let's see if we can get there in five years. We'll learn about it, etc. Et well, when five years happens, you're ready. Now, if you're a reactive manager, you're kind of like, let's keep making the stuff, you know, same old, same old. And then, of course, your sales begin to decline and decline and decline. And then you do the traditional thing, which is cut expenses, cut expenses. And then somebody says at a meeting, you know what, we should be in frozen foods. But now you've exhausted your, your workforce. Your, you may not have the financial resources to do it. And you're out of business. Why? Because you never thought maybe we should have a plan. That's what a proactive manager does. A proactive warrior is looking at a much bigger plan than the reactive warrior. The reactive warrior, warrior is good, is looking at what's happening today. The proactive warrior is looking at what's happening five years from now. And that's what we're trying to encourage you to understand. It's not enough to just be a, a good person. It's not enough to be an ethical manager. You have to be a proactive manager. You have to see the, the picture bigger, and you have to be more inclusive. And so, um, yeah, and so that's that.